we are taking, focusing on self-knowledge in classical China and India, and our first speaker is Michael Pewitt. Welcome up. So my deep thanks to the organizers for putting this together. It is an honor to be here. And for some of you, you might be wondering why would someone be talking about China in a conference devoted to self-knowledge? After all, we are dealing with a tradition that is infamously known for saying some rather mean things about the self. To give a couple of examples and rather influential ones at that, Confucius famously says one of the key moves in self-cultivation, really one of the key first steps, is that you overcome, or a much more literal translation, you conquer the self on the path toward becoming a good person. A little bit later, Zhuangzi, another extraordinarily influential figure, will repeatedly say we must forget the self in order to achieve what he is calling for us to achieve. So at first glance, um, the Chinese tradition might not be perhaps the most obvious candidate for inclusion in this discussion. It needless to say, I think it is wonderful that China is being brought into the discussion, and I think there is a lot we can learn from the tradition. And to do so, what I will spend my few moments doing is explaining some of these notions of the self that we are being asked to conquer, overcome, forget, and then look at what it is they, on the contrary, are asking us to do. And as we will see, this is far from a rejection of self-knowledge. It is a vision of what self-knowledge would be if you take an alternate vision of what the self is. So let's begin there. What is this self that we are being asked to conquer and overcome? As you can probably imagine from the fact that we are being asked to do so, um, the notion of the self here is not what we would immediately call a very inviting notion. They would also say, however, it is an empirical fact that this is in part what we are like. So let me just begin with a few descriptions of the self from the Chinese tradition. What is the self? The self is a messy bunch of stuff. Stuff being a very broad and pretty good translation to refer to a bunch of messy energies that are within us and within the entire cosmos and certainly within the rest of us as well. A messy, messy bunch of energies. And we also have faculties. We have souls, very much in the plural. We have a little bit of spirit that we can gain a little bit more of that we can also lose entirely. And every human being is a messy, messy bunch of these different energies, faculties, and other types of stuff that we can try to categorize in different ways. But even our categories, of course, make it seem like it makes a lot more sense than it in fact does. This is true of us. It is true of the world at large, other humans, and again, what we would mistakenly call the natural world. In all of these, us, in our relationships with each other and in our relationships to things out there, we form patterns of interaction in this messiness, which are oftentimes, um, in certain situations, horrible, horrible. This is true in general, but it's particularly true for us humans. So let me say a little bit more about what happens with these messy bunches of stuff when we, for example, start interacting with others, which sadly we do from a very young age. So what happens when one messy bunch of stuff interacts with another human, but i.e. another messy bunch of stuff? Well, what we will do is we will pull out, again, a more literal translation, drag out from each other different energies by things we do. So let me begin with some obvious examples. Someone yells at me, I'm angry. Someone smiles at me, I'm happy. In this way of thinking, someone yelling at me drags out my energy of anger, and hence I'm overwhelmed with anger. Someone smiles, it drags out from me an energy of happiness, I feel happy. And, as you can see from these examples, we are dangerously, purely passive in this. Immediate things happening around us drag out different responses affecting our immediate emotions, but those immediate emotions then, of course, dominate the things we will do right after that, which will affect others as well, and this creates these incredibly dangerous patterns of interaction. That person yelling at me drags out my anger of energy, I will do the same for others, and this can go on and on and on. 
In fact, it's not just going on and on for me. It will, as we will see, go on and on in a deeper sense as well because it gets much worse. Because at least in those examples, sure, I'm passive, but at least I'm like really responding to something there, like someone does yell at me, someone does smile at me. It gets much worse because also from a very young age, we're like, we're talking age two, right? This is really pretty bleak stuff. Also from a very young age, we fall into patterns of interacting where someone will do something that isn't even necessarily mean, but will remind me emotionally of that earlier person who yelled at me, it equally drags out my energy of anger. And from a very young age, we cease to even respond to the world actually out there. We are responding by pattern, by rote, by habit. And these become so ingrained in us that we dangerously think, it's just me. That's just who I am. I'm just someone who has a really bad temper. Not because I naturally am so, it's because I've fallen into a habitual way of interacting as such. And it gets more bleak still. Because once we fall into these patterns of interacting, since that's true of everyone we're interacting with, you will get these gnarly patterns of interaction that can define relationships, families, social structures. They can become so embedded, not just in us, but in the entire social world we are living in. And they can go on for generations. This is the world we are living in. And as you can already see immediately from my earlier hints about the rest of the world, It's not like we're going to get salvation out there because out there is the same. Patterns of interaction that are horribly dangerous that therefore create these, for us often, horrifically dangerous situations that we don't even see because we think they're natural. In short, we are living in a world of dangerous but solidified patterns of interaction that dominate human interactions, that dominate our relationships with the larger natural world, that dominate our relationships with the various divine powers who therefore become become extraordinarily demonic, and that is the world we are living in. Now, all of this sounds maybe perhaps slightly bleak, but where therefore does potential hope lie? Clearly, as you can see, not from looking for some true self within, by definition, not clearly by looking for some purely good power out there because there are no purely good powers in a world that works in this way, what you do is, well, let's just go back to that quote I referred to very quickly from Confucius and expand it. Here's the full quote. You conquer the self by, get ready, submitting yourself to ritual And only then can you start becoming humane. Huh? (laughs) So, we talked a little bit about the self. Let me talk a little bit about ritual, which, as you can see, just as their vision of self is a little different from the one we take for granted, their notion of ritual is as well. So what does ritual do in this vision? Ritual is not, and it's strongly distinguished from, what we would call custom, which for them is simply what we tend to think of as ritual. In other words, custom is simply repetitive patterned interactions, which needless to say for them are bad. But for them, customs basically are a product of these very dangerous interactions that can become solidified. That's what customs are. Rituals are attempts to break us out of these patterned interactions. Ritual for them involves an attempt to force you, this is why you're submitted to it, that forces you to break from your usual interactions and forces you for that brief moment of time to become a different person, interacting with those around you, often the most tension-filled figures in your life, those around you in different ways, forcing you to break out of the usual patterns of behavior. To give you some examples that will clearly make the point, among these are very commonly role reversals. Let me give you a standard example. As you can imagine, in what was then a very patriarchal society, one of the many tensions that sets in 
are father-son interactions, in which we know the pattern very well. We're sadly still very much more in that world than we would like to think, sadly. It's a world in which power belongs to the father. That power, when he dies, will turn to the son, and you get these very dangerous, we would call them Oedipal conflicts, playing out. The discussions in China actually are very comparable, and not surprisingly. So what do you do? Do you have dad and son sit down and have a nice chat? Um, needless to say, no, because that will just repeat the same patterns. So the ritual, in this case, involves forcing them. And again, you're forced. You have no choice but to do this over and over again. The father and son enter a ritual space. And they do a role reversal, but not just with themselves. They do it with the deceased father of the father as well, because, of course, that father, now deceased, is still playing out in these generational transfers. And so dad, now in a position of power, is playing out all that he had, all of those tensions, all of those conflicts with his father, who is now deceased and in danger of being a very demonic force. And now dad is playing out those exact same patterns on his poor son and on and on. So what do they do in that ritual? When they walk into the ritual, the son is no longer the son. He's his grandfather. And the father is the son of his own son. If you're talking about a ruler, the son, but now he's not the son, of course, sits on the throne and faces south, the ritual position of the ruler. The father, but now he's the son, faces him, looking north, bowing to him, his father, but it's really his son, and replicates again all of those feelings and emotions and tensions of being the subordinate figure, yet again, except with his own son on whom he's playing out those exact same tensions from the opposite perspective. And meanwhile, the son learns from a very young age what it means to be in a position of power over someone else. All of the feelings of power, arrogance, anger, concern that one will eventually lose one's power, playing out except with the very figure who's playing out, out against him. And the argument of, the, of these visions is, by forcing people to do this, you break their usual patterns of interaction, which of course raises the obvious question, why? Why, if your concern are patterns of interaction, why would creating new patterns be better? Well, the example in part answers the question, because, as you can already see, ritual for them is not something you're socialized into being, right? The goal of this ritual is not to socialize the son into being his grandfather, <laughs> and it's not socializing the father into being the son of his own son. The point of ritual is that break. It breaks your usual patterns of interaction, and the reason you do it over and over again, this and tons of other ones, is that over time the argument is, if you continue doing it well, you are slowly beginning to, instead of reacting passively to the world around you, and again, by patterned ways, so you're not even sensing the world around you, you're slowly being trained, and eventually, actively, you are training yourself at a certain point into this, to actually begin to see the world as, yes, messy. <laughs> You're actually beginning to sense that, yes, dad <laughs> is actually not this vicious authoritarian figure who wants to, to, to push you down. You begin to see the complexities. You begin to see the complexities in yourself. You begin to see the complexities in your relationship, but see, of course, in the stronger sense of emotionally feeling those messy, complex tensions. And only by doing that do you slowly become able to work with those, to operate in a way that will alter those relationships. Those relationships with other humans, equally true with those relationships, as you can already see with poor dead dad, in granddad, with the demonic forces above us. You're trying to create relationships in which we can flourish. And what would that mean? Here is part of what I find so intriguing about the tradition. They refuse to give an answer. What they will say, and I'll use their terms, you're trying to learn to resonate with those around you. You're trying to learn to sense the complexity of those around you. You're trying to learn to, to sense when I do little things, it sets off certain patterns. And how, if I do something slightly differently, will it alter that situation in some way 
that will allow as best as possible everyone to flourish. And it's a training exercise. You do it at the most mundane levels every day, you know, dealing with the poor <laughs> dad-son relationships in that example, and you're working at a larger level too. The idea is you are training yourself to be the sort of person who can sense this in mundane situations, sense this in larger social situations, sense this indeed in the larger cosmos because the entire cosmos is messy. It's all based on relationships all the way down. And if that's the way the world is, we are training ourselves to operate within it. Indeed, I mentioned in passing Zhuangzi's notion of forgetting the self, same vision. Basically, he comes out of the same tradition and simply says, let's explode this notion of ritual, explode isn't quite the right term, gra greatly enhance this notion of ritual so it includes everything. So Zhuangzi will write a text that will sort of do the equivalent of a role reversal ritual, except with everything. So you read the text and, and you become a butterfly, a bird, a tree bark, all of which is trying to break our usual dangerously perspectival patterned relationships and open up the possibility of actually working with the world. In short, the goal of this is to say, indeed, the goal of this is to create a world where we realize it's self-constructed. Self now being the key word in a very different way than we usually use it. Self meaning we humans are constructing a world self-consciously that will impact everything, and therefore, since, as you can see, embedded in this, the sense is that we usually do it horribly, the goal is you're training yourself and being forced at a young age to be trained to start doing it well. Is this self-knowledge? Yes. Because what I would like to say is part of the power of this tradition is it opens up very different ways of thinking about the self, very different ways of thinking about knowledge, and yet it's the same problematic that we've been discussing because it's all about the training that occurs to allow us to work effectively in the world to hopefully create a world where we and all of those around us and ultimately everything around us could finally begin to flourish. Thank you so much. Thank you. Michael, can I, am I allowed to simplify things and say Please. Socrates talks about a self and believes that there's some kind of order in the world and you are, should change yourself and change the world. Where Confucius says we are, we are many selves Yes. and the world is not in order, it's just a mess bombarding yes. us with, with stuff Yes. and we should rather learn to adapt rather than to to believe that we can change the world. Or, or I think that would be sort of an opening step, but the ultimate goal is actually to truly change the world. In other words, we shouldn't simply adapt to these patterns. The goal is actually to realize the world around us is a world we humans have created, usually poorly, huh? usually unselfconsciously, usually based therefore on horrific patterns of interaction at a local and a larger level. And if we sense properly how we could begin acting in ways that would alter these relationships, we can indeed truly begin to change the world. Mm -hmm. So the goal actually is to realize the world that we think of as natural, ourselves and outside, is a construct, and usually a really bad construct, mm -hmm. and we could construct it better. How strong is the tradition of Confucius, Mencius, and the way today in Chinese thinking? Great question. It's yes. beginning to come back, <laughs> but I, use, I emphasize the word beginning in that strong tone of voice because for about a century now, there has been an active attempt to wipe out all of this. All of this was defined as tradition. Mao infamously yeah. would burn the books. The temples were destroyed. But is the regime yes. deftly using it without saying it? It, using is the key word. So at the moment, the regime of Xi Jinping is trying to claim, among other things, that it's bringing back the Confucian tradition to create a proper Confucian modernity. Uh, the truth is, no. I mean, what Xi Jinping represents is an authoritarian form of state capitalism. But the uh, intriguing thing is these ideas are coming back. People are debating them on the blogosphere. There's a very subtle way in which you can critique what's going on by referring to certain passages, reading them differently than the government will read them. So in that sense, getting back to the heart of your question, it is coming back in a very exciting way. Mm -hmm. 
I failed to get an explanation of the axial age with Christopher, so I, I make another attempt with you, Michael. <laughs> yes. Why, why <laughs> did, did suddenly all these I ideas yeah. appear at the same time? It, it, it appear is... Apparently with no connection. Indeed, with no connection, and as you said, roughly at the same time. It's true in Greece, it is true in China, it's true in South Asia, and very quickly what is going on is you've had about three millennia before this in Eurasia, in which the entire world in the agricultural areas at least, was defined by a very strong body of aristocratic societies in which everything, power, wealth, everything was defined purely by heredity. And over the course of the first millennium BCE, across the board, all of these regimes crumble. All of the religions associated with them, we'll refer to these as Bronze Age religions, begin to crumble. You get an extraordinary growth of both political experimentation, but more to the heart of our concerns here, political and religious experimentation going on across the board. And as the why question, uh, multifarious. So what we are now being able to see archeologically is you're getting a spread of a number of things. Some of these are technologies, so Iron is a very famous one mm -hmm. because iron implements allow, well, it, iron is very easy to use once you learn the technology, it just means a lot of heat. Once you can use iron, you can start mass producing agricultural wet, um, materials that allows tremendous growth in agricultural produce, huge populations growth. You can also mass produce weapons and you can start organizing mass military armies. And just with those two alone, and one This is not an examples. answer, this is an, uh, a lecture. Thank no, you very much. But <laughs> two sentences, but it creates for the first time a breakdown of that old order. It's a pleasure yes. to have you on the stage. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. It, it will be Anders Hogg who will talk about Buddhism for us today. Uh, here is Hogg. So, uh, hello, my friends. And uh, hello, organizers, I am also thanking. So who am I? I'm not Anton Schels. You expected someone called Anton Schels. He's in the program, and now I'm here. Why? Well, he got very ill all of a sudden, a couple of weeks ago. So I was trying to find uh, someone who could re replace him. I was searching all around the world, but, you know, who, who can come in, you know, in, in such a short notice? So, and I think the Buddhistic view on this uh, subject is very important. So, therefore, I will say something. I feel very, myself feel very small in this illustrious company of great professors. I'm not a professor. Uh, I don't even have a doctor's hat. Uh, I'm not even a scholar of Buddhism. I'm just a simple student. Um, I wouldn't designate myself as Buddhist because I don't like designations. But I, I am someone who walks the path. I'm striving on the path. And that path could be called Buddhistic, even though I Personally, I take inspiration from other sources also, but Buddhism is a great source for me uh, of inspiration. And maybe it's just as well that such a lowly person as me uh, speak about Buddhism, because Buddhism is a path. It's, it's not the doctrine, it's not the teaching, it's not, you know, uh, when you go to the core of Buddhism, it's a path. Um, I will try to say something about self-knowledge in the teachings of the Buddha. And that might seem as a contradiction, because it's uh, very, quite well known that uh, Buddha was teaching anatma, not atma, not self. So how can we speak about self-knowledge? Well, First, I want to say something about many misconceptions of Buddhism. When I was a youngster and went to high school, I heard that Buddhism is the most pessimistic view that you can have. Uh, it's all about suffering. Uh, and the aim is just to end the suffering. And how do you do that? You give up all desires. You give up all thirst for life. 
Uh, and then when you die, if you are in such a state, then you merge into nirvana. And what is nirvana? It's nothingness. So business finished, you are gone, and no return. But then when I was meeting monks and nuns, nuns uh, Buddhistic ones from all over the world, I would see they were very happy. <laughs> they were all be smiling. So maybe this is a misconception of what is Buddhism. And then I was meeting uh, Westerner followers of Buddhism. And they were saying, Buddhism, Buddhism is not a religion, it's a philosophy. But Traveling around in Asia, you clearly see that Buddhism is a religion. There are uh, statues of Buddha. Some are considered more holy than others with magical powers. There are relics with magical powers that can heal you, can give you uh, many sounds uh, if you ask for it. Uh, there are holy places. You can go to pilgrimage tours. If you uh, look at the Eastern uh, Asia version of, of Buddhism, there are um, uh, kind of heavens called pure lands. And uh, there are holy scriptures that are so holy that if you just listen to them once, you are liberated. So, so it's obviously a religion. But it's not a philosophy. Uh, if you actually listen to the words of, of um, Gautama Buddha, uh, Siddhartha uh, Shakyamuni is the same person. Uh, I will call him the Buddha. He is the historical Buddha. Um, he was not into, you know, creating some logically uh, watertight system uh, that is true by just words and, and uh, formulations. In Buddhism, there is some kind of suspiciousness against philosophy and the capacity of rational mind. Uh, a modern Buddhist teacher, he was saying, he was quoting Descartes and saying, I'm thinking, therefore I am not. <laughs> um, to, be, to be a person, to be someone is, is no mind. Uh, so I could stop here and we could just sit in silence and trying to uh, experience that. Then you would understand uh, the core of Buddhism. But I will go on speaking. And Buddhist teachers are always many, using many words and there are so many books. So, um, But you know, there is this famous finger, a finger pointing towards the moon. You shouldn't look at the finger. You shouldn't believe in the finger. You should look at the moon yourself. So all the teachings is just something pointing towards something that you have to find out for yourself. Uh, there is nothing that you really should believe in. Um, I think I'll leave this. Um, something of the, sp the, the spirit here uh, uh, of this is here. All views are wrong views. All conceptions are misconceptions. So the truth and, and, and uh, the Buddha and Buddhist, they believe there are some kind of truth, but it's not contained in words. So it's not, you know, this Socrates way of, of uh, asking questions and debating and, and, you know, trying to find out what is truth uh, by words. Uh, teachings are just a, it's a raft, it's, you know, something, a tool you use, and when you have used it, uh, you leave it. The most important things are practice, practices, like walking. You can think that uh, Walking on this earth is a miracle. Each step reveals the Dharmakaya, the, uh, the, the knowledge, the knowledge body of, of Buddha. Just, you know, feel it in the step. So it's, it's, it's uh, I'm outsider here in this company in many ways, because it's not by words. 
It's, it's by experience you can understand yourself. And um, you can see something of the spirit of, of this in, in the so-called free jewels. You, you, uh, you repeat this when you get initiated into Buddhism, and, and monks and nuns are also you know, taking refuge in it. But you say, I take refuge in the Buddha. He's the one who shows me the way. So it's just you know showing a way or going somewhere, not the not the not the truth, you know, by words. I take refuge in the Dharma. It's just a way of understanding and love. And then you have the Sangha, the community that surrounds you, that supports you. So friends are important. Uh, they can ask you, what are you doing? And then you wake up. Uh, you become mindful. And mindfulness is the tool to be truly present in every moment. And you use different ways of, of uh, awaken yourself during the day. Yeah? You have rituals, yes. You have uh, uh, you you can say this kind of um, uh, verses that I said now in whatever you do. You peel the, the, the potato, you do the dishes, uh, um, uh, you wash your body. Whatever you do, you should be mindful. And in this mindfulness, it's like an energy and it's like a light. And in that light, you begin to understand yourself a little bit. And a little bit, you know, step by step. And hopefully in thousand lifetimes <laughs> you you get somewhere um, and the D Buddha in the end of his life uh, he, there, he had so many followers and th these followers they started to split into fractions they were fighting about what is the true teaching yeah? Buddha said that this no he didn't say he said this and what is right uh, so in the end of his life, he was so frustrated with this. He said that during my 45 years as a teacher, I taught nothing. You know, so it's there is don't don't get stuck in the teaching. And um, this is from the Atadipa Sutta, and it continues like this: that those are islands. You know, you should be an island to to yourself. I mean, you need the support from others, but you should, you no, know, it's in within yourself, whatever that is, uh, cannot grasp it by words. Uh, you start to investigate. Um, and about this is, you know, uh, touching the first two noble truths, you know, there are four noble truths, and the first noble truth is about suffering. There is suffering. Uh, but it's not that everything is suffering. Eh? You have to look for what is the suffering in my life. And, and um, you have to try to recognize it, that it's there. Yeah, okay, you have to allow it and embrace it and uh, try to heal it. Um, and then there are the uh, two other noble truths, uh, is that there is a way out of suffering. Yeah? And this is the way. And he was showing this eightfold path. And there are many, many tools that you can use. And meditation is you know, the main tool. And it is the, the mindfulness. And the first part of it is to stop, shamat, to stop you know, this constant flow of, of thoughts. The, the default position of the mind is the wandering mind. It's always going on. Eh? So stop it by you know, focusing on breathing, on what you are doing, and then it's vipassana, is to look deeply. There is another sutta called Satipatthana Sutta. And in that sutta, uh, the Buddha is showing that he is not, you know, uh, pointing us to some completely different world. He says that nirvana is samsara, 
samsara is the you know the wheel uh, of birth and death and like that. But samsara, the, the the pure land, uh, the heaven is here, is here and now and nowhere else. There are no other place to go. There's no nowhere to go, uh, and there is really nothing to do, because the absolute truth is here, if you can experience it. Uh, so this sutta is going through, through the body, you, you observe your body, you observe your uh, feelings in the feeling, um, and uh, the force in the force, and the, uh, the objects of the force, and like that. Um, now, few, two, one, a few words about this non-self, anatma. Um, it's not that there is no self at all. It's just that, there are, that the self has not any separate existence. The, the self is constant, is, you know, is created, is an emergent, emergent thing uh, from a kind of system. Um, uh, there are two truths in Buddhism, and that's the, the, the worldly or, or the relative truth and, and uh, the absolute truth. And uh, in the relative truth, you investigate, you know, your body, your thoughts, your feelings. You go come deeper and deeper. You become more and more calm. You see more things more clearly. You don't you don't get caught by all, all these uh, uh, thoughts and uh, emotions and like that. Uh, you become more centered and peaceful, and then you can start to look more deeply into the absolute truth. Uh, there, it is. <laughs> Ending by looking deeply into the absolute truth, a brilliant end of, of your speech. Yes. <laughs> but but what, what is, what's wrong with the self in Buddhism as you are taught to, to sort of erase yourself to become nothing? What's the problem? So, uh, uh, yeah, again, it's not that you have to erase. You should not erase. Uh, you should just observe. I'm saying in this meditation and uh, in contemplation, uh, you observe and you allow, uh, you accept what is there. Mm -hmm. but still you you should and you embrace it. You embrace it and you heal it. But you strive to achieve this nothing. No, it's, it's a transformation. It's a transformation. And, and uh, this nothingness means if it's empty, what is it empty of? It's empty of something separate. We are all interdependent. You are completely dependent on everything else. Your body is actually physically stardust. And, and uh, you depend on other people, on air, on the uh, microorganisms in, in your intestines and like that. You don't, you are not and what independent. Is what is the self in this? The, the self is, uh, I mean, it's, it's complicated what is the self, but you, there is a, uh, 50 minutes is so short. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, uh, Could we define uh, this as a soul, uh, uh, as mind, as... No, no it's everything. Huh? Hmm? It's everything. Yeah. And, and, uh, well, welcome back to the panel discussion. I'll throw you to Michael and his questions. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for preparing yourself in such a short time, yes. delivering it so well. Thank you. <laughs> Hinduism, Ravi Gupta. Let us expand and complicate <coughs> things. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, first of all, it's my great pleasure to be here, and I'm deeply grateful uh, to those who invited me and those who arranged uh, my travel here from the United States. My body is telling me I've been up all night with no sleep, so if I do fall asleep during this presentation, please don't wake me. Um, <laughs> So, um, it, there's so much to say about this subject, and as everyone has complained, we have very little time. Uh, and so, 
I'm, I'm going to, I guess, continue with the axial age uh, that we've been working our way through and um, uh, take us to the Upanishads, which are a very significant um, uh, sacred literature in Hinduism today, uh, going back to the axial age. Um, so let's start uh, with this uh, short passage. Sadeva somyam idamagra asit. In the beginning, this world was simply what is existent, one only, without a second. Ekam evadvitiyam. This is probably today the, the beginning of the most famous passage from the Upanishads, from the Chandogya Upanishad in particular. And this simple statement carries within it several important assumptions or axioms about the way that uh, the Upanishads see the nature of the self and its relationship to ultimate reality. My presentation is going to be a transition, something from to a more theistic approach to the self that we're going to um, spend quite a bit of time with later this afternoon. So. A couple of assumptions here. Uh, if we had more time, I would ask you to un unpack the assumptions, but I'll do it for you since the time is very short. Um, so first of all, uh, let me say that um, there's three assumptions that I want to focus on. One is that there is uh, an origin. There is something at the beginning. And the text actually says this in the next sentence, that there can be no beginning from nothing, that there must be something at the beginning. So that's really uh, something very important. The other is that whatever that thing is at the beginning, uh, it's eternal. The word here is sat, that which is existent, which this Upanishad uses as a synonym for Brahman, or the ultimate reality. And then thirdly, and I guess importantly, uh, it's the source of everything. So everything is unified. The Upanishads are convinced that deep down, under all the labels and designations and names and forms that we attribute to the world, if we peel those away, we take off the masks that we wear as professors and as speakers and as, as family persons and as all kinds of different roles that we have, and we peel them back, then at the ground, at the basis of everything, we will find this ultimate reality, this self that is the self within and is the self of all beings. So this brings us to perhaps the most famous passage in the Upanishads uh, altogether. Uh, today and for quite some centuries, uh, simply three words, tat, tvam, asi, you are that. And this is the end, uh, this is the punchline for a, a beautiful parable of sorts that uh, is described in the Chandogya, where a uh, young man returns home after 12 years of education. And the text says that he is swell-headed. He's arrogant and proud about what he has learned. But when his father asks him a simple question about the nature of reality, he's not able to answer. To his credit, he asks to be taught. And the father uses a set of uh, experiments to help him learn. One of these is that he asks him to take a glass of water and a little bit of salt and dissolve the salt in the water. Uh, then he asks him to find the salt, and he's not able to do so. Uh, he says, instead, why don't you sip it? And he sips the, the water, and the father asks him, what does it taste like? And he says, well, salty. And he says, sip it from the other side. What does it taste like? Salty. Uh, and then he concludes with these words, that the self, although it cannot be seen through our eyes, it is present, and it is present throughout all things. It can be experienced. That self, which is present in all things, he says, a worm, a gnat, a mosquito, a dog, an elephant, that is who you are as well. That is you. Tat tvam asi. So an incredible vision of unity and bringing things together, okay? And this would be very simple and straightforward. It would all make 
it would all be very consistent if it were not for the very next sentence, which says, moves us from the vision of unity to a vision of plurality. Tadaikshata bahusyam prajayeya. And it thought, let me become many, let me propagate myself. Right away, we've got a couple more things introduced. Crucially, and it thought. Whatever this thing is, at the beginning of all things, it's conscious, it's aware, it has the ability to perceive. But there's also something even more important embedded here, and that's desire. That there is drive, that is, there's desire present. There's a need for relationship that is there. And so, the Upanishad takes us from a vision of radical unity to a push towards plurality, towards multiplicity. And it's within this tension, this tension between unity and diversity, between oneness and difference, between difference and non-difference, that's where the tension of the Upanishads lies. Again and again, trying to make sense of the diversity of this world together with its vision for its unity, for its uniformity, for its simplicity. And those traditions of philosophy which are born from the Upanishads, namely the Vedanta traditions, are constantly debating this matter at issue. How do we deal with difference and non-difference at the same time? I just want to show these to you. There are four key questions that Vedanta is interested in. What is the ultimate reality, Brahman? And the great debate here is, is this ultimate reality uniform? nameless, formless, present everywhere, indistinct, or is it personal? Is it God? Is it a deity who is capable of name, form, and relationship? Then to our question, who are we? What is our nature? And uh, again, uh, are we all radically one? Are we unified? Or is individuality somehow fundamental? Is difference somehow fundamental to the nature of this world? Um, what is the nature of the world? This is a particularly striking problem for Vedanta because it's essentially the problem of evil. It's the same problem that emerges, that rears its ugly head in any theistic system. Here it's presented in a slightly different way than we're normally used to hearing it, but the question is essentially the same. How do we make sense of a world that is temporary, changing, full of misery, uh, um, often unconscious, unaware, ignorant, with an ultimate reality from which it comes that is eternal, sat, conscious, chit, and blissful, ananda. And finally, the real question, what do we do with all of this? What is the path to moksha? or liberation. Um, and here, the divergence lies between a path of knowledge and a path of devotion, one that focuses primarily on the cognitive and meditative practices of knowing ourselves, and the other that says true self-knowledge is only possible in the context of relationship with others. Uh, jnana or bhakti. Uh, this broadly sits on a spectrum of radical non-dualists and dualists. Uh, it's, it's not two poles, it's really a spectrum of different perspectives. But there's just one thought that I want to leave you with, which is to say that each one of these traditions that I've talked about, the dualist and the non-dualist perspective, both end up in a very interesting place, which is to say the only way to reconcile this push of difference and non-difference, the unity and the multiplicity that we talked about at the beginning, is, is by coming to the point of achintya, or inconceivability. Whether it's inconceivability or paradox, this is a technical question that um, we, we, we don't have time to discuss, uh, and there's differences of opinion among scholars about this. But the idea being that one way or the other, 
both need to be held together simultaneously. That the unity of selfhood, that the non-difference that exists within our world, the, the ground of reality that we share in common, and the distinctiveness, the individuality of its, uh, of its, of its participants, uh, the, the variety that is present in this world, both have to be held together with neither one reduced to the other. There's got to be some way of holding them both. And because that process of holding those opposites is, of course, difficult to do for the human mind, uh, therefore, at some point, we're going to end up at a place of inconceivability, achintya, or inexpressibility, anirvachaniya, uh, depending on the tradition that you belong to. Uh, and so uh, I'll conclude by saying that our inability to understand the nature of this world and the nature of the self is characteristic of that world. Uh, our inability to understand it is its most important quality. Um, I'll stop there and see if you have any questions. What you've talked about is very much philosophy, metaphysics. Where does religion fit into this framework? So, um, if we uh, go back to the more dualist traditions uh, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, place greater emphasis upon um, the differences between individuals and the differences between ourselves and Brahman, that this ultimate reality both contains us but is also distinct from us at the same time, then that distinction is the place where relationship becomes possible, mm -hmm. right? And so this tradition here, the Chaitanya Vaishnav tradition from the 16th century, uh, which is where I focus, essentially says that uh, the very nature is of Brahman, of ultimate reality, is that it is an infinitely relational being, right? So the non-dualists say you have to remove all the relationships to come to the simplicity at the heart of it. And the Vaishnava tradition say, no, you need to pile that, those differences upon and increase the relationality to a point where the ultimate relational being is God, right? And that's what allows for that relationship between the human being, between the devotee and the divine. So that's mm -hmm. where religion uh, uh, emerges in, in sort of a mm -hmm. devotional sense. I'll bring up the other two to form our panel. How do these three traditions differ from each other when it comes to today's theme, self-knowledge? What is special about Confucius' teaching in this respect? I think what it brings to the table is an argument that what we think of as the self, the natural self that we already have, always think of that as a construct and a dangerous construct that could be and should be constructed differently. Mm -hmm. uh, if I would compare with, with Confucianism, uh, then the Buddhism is uh, quite different because it's um, it's not so much focused on on uh, on the relations within the society like this. It was uh, part of all uh, the um, <coughs> the shaman uh, traditions in India in, at the time of the Upanishads. They lived out in the forests. And in parks, so they were not so involved uh, in all this. Uh, they were more focused on, on your own liberation and how you can help others to liberate, not how to make the society work, even though Buddhists today are using Buddhist, uh, Buddhistic ethics to help society and like that. But I'm thinking about Taoism in China. There is many similarities between Taoism and, and Buddhism. Absolutely. 
Yes. So that's something different, isn't it? Something else. You just keep nodding to each other, but tell us the rest of us uh? what, what, what you're t <laughs> referring to. Indeed. So uh, a figure I mentioned very briefly, Zhuangzi, is one of the, the key figures that will lead to the later tradition of Taoism. It's a, it's a later term. But here, too, it's very intriguing. Zhuangzi, as we've noted, is in part playing out of the same notion and just trying to dramatically expand it. So so one of Zhuangzi's critique of Confucius, critiques of Confucius, Confucius is, Confucius is mainly simply talking about human relations. And Zhuangzi wants to say, expand this to the entire cosmos. Everything is relationships. And therefore, the same kind of, of work needs to be done with absolutely everything. Okay. But all and uh, uh, can I just say yes. one more thing? Because yeah, in compa comparison to here, to the Hindu or whatever is before in Upanishadic times, it was not Hinduism, it was something different. But uh, at the time of the Buddha, there were these shraman movements and part of them were uh, those who were writing the Upanishads and like that. Uh, uh, Gautama Buddha, he differed from them because he didn't believe in the uh, you know, in a different substance, that something, a, a soul that was made of a different substance and that was eternal uh, and uh, not changing. He was saying that everything is changing. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the difference. So, mm. In what respect is Hinduism in any form different from... So, so yeah, uh, uh, Anders has essentially said what I was going to say, which is that uh, I in terms of the nature of the world and its constructed quality, I think the ways in which Buddhism discusses the world it would be very familiar to the Upanishads. Uh, I think where the Upanishads differ is the insistence that underneath that construction, uh, underneath those masks and those names and forms, that there is something uh, that is... Um, essential, that is mm. permanent, that is substantive. All the three ideas you have introduced seem to be more metaphysical <coughs> than Socrates' teaching. He's more epistemic, he's more interested in, in knowledge than in the origin of the world, etc. Is this, is, is this correct? Uh, there's so much ep epistemology that one could discuss in the Upanishads. Mm. Um, I, I, I think it's a it's a quirk of the way I did it that I mm. chose to approach it from a metaphysical uh, perspective. But one could one could do plenty of epistemology in the Vedantic traditions. Uh, I wouldn't say that it, you know it differs in that way, uh, Buddhist, because it's very much about here and now, uh, about you know your life. Mm. That that you know you are very much concerned with 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 with, with your intentions. Uh, what do you want to do? Are you sure you go deeper ab about your intentions and like that? It's just that it's not so much of a discussion, uh, it's not a public mm -hmm. discussion. It's, it's more a discussion within yourself, but also with, you know, that you get knowledge through experience instead of just talking. Mm -hmm. But Socrates seems to be quite uninterested in where he comes from and, and where he's going at the end. He's more interested in what's happening now during my lifetime. Am I correct? Or uh, you, when I read yes. Socrates, I read him as through the lens of the Upanishads, and he looks very different. <laughs> I, um, give, so, uh, I give up. I, I, the, 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 the final dialogue, what's it called? Uh, the... the um, uh, yeah, uh, oh. to, to me that's very much an Upanishadic dialogue. Of course, oh. I'm biased there, but I'm an example of the joy of being ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for the break. We will call you back in no time at all. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>